Welcome, thanks for coming. I'm gonna talk about Viktor Frankl a little bit here today. I'm gonna do a little bit of a um, little psychology 101 to talk a little bit about his influences and sort of the context that he came up in. We like around here to talk about um, authors and what they're responding to, and he was certainly in a mix of responding to particularly Freud and Adler, so I'm gonna talk about them a little bit. I'm gonna also talk about my own sort of reasons for appreciating Frankel, and, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the therapy that he developed, which he called logotherapy, from the Greek word logos. Uh, he, uh, it's also called existential psychotherapy, humanistic psychotherapy. He has the roots in those um, areas. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so why this matters to me is uh, I began a long time ago my own project of trying to figure out how to integrate uh, faith and suffering uh, because of different things that happen in my own early life. I also uh, find uh, a need to understand how my choices interact with God's sovereignty because I believe that God is sovereign and that, um, that he is writing the story in a very complete way and yet I also believe that our choices matter very much and so trying to figure out how to put those two things together has been another piece of my project. And then becoming a counselor or marriage family therapist, um, my work is largely the work of helping people uh, find meaning in their experiences in their lives and their suffering in particular. And that is certainly one of uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, big themes. So uh, that's part of why I've been attracted to him. I also have, uh, this is a little personal note, uh, for when I met, for when I first met the writings of Viktor Frankl, uh, many of you know the story that my mother had a stroke when uh, I was actually just starting graduate school to study to be a counselor when she had her stroke. And she um, was in a nursing home for the last two years of her life, was pretty much paralyzed and couldn't speak. And she was in pretty constant physical pain when she was awake. Um, she had a lot of, her muscles cramped a lot. She would cry out. And, and so this really challenged me to watch someone who had been, um, she was a believer, she loved God, she um, trusted God, and it was hard for me to watch that ending for her. <laughs> Um, and so that was when I began my program, Learning to Be a Counselor, it's also when I ran into the writings of Viktor Frankl. And so it was very timely. As an aside, it's also when I ran into the writings of Corey Ten Boom, who also shares the experience of Viktor Frankl in having lived in the concentration camps during World War II. Um, and Corey Ten Boom, it turns out, has another thing in common with my mom. She had a stroke at the end of her life and was rendered silent for the last five years of her life. Um, and her caregiver uh, wrote a book about that, and that book was also very meaningful to me at that time. So Viktor Frankl um, was really helpful me in my project to integrate suffering and faith and to understand what, is, what does this mean and why, uh, why suffering? So, um, so, Viktor Frankl. I'm going to start with a little bio of him and then a little divergence into Psych 101, <laughs> history, actually history of psychology 101. Um, so, Frankl, before the war, uh, he was born in 1905 in Vienna. He was raised in his family's Judaism. He was quite the student of the Torah. The, his parents wanted him to um, study to be... Um, a teacher because he was he knew it kind of backwards and forwards in his early life by the time he was in uh, his adolescence he moved away from that however and he describes it as an atheistic phase that he went through through high school and college I have a sense from the amount of him that I've read uh, and his own ref recollections he has a autobiography called recollections he doesn't come right out and say that he back to his faith in Judaism. Um, I, I don't know where he landed, but I know that he definitely brought um, God back into the picture for himself in um, certain ways. So um, anyway, living in Vienna, which is where Freud and Adler both worked, 
lived and worked. He went to the same secondary school as the same one that Freud went to earlier. And he became fascinated with Freud's ideas. So we're going to talk a minute about Papa Freud here. Um, Freud's major contributions, he lived uh, 1856 to 1939. He studied and worked in Vienna. He was actually born in Moravia. He is, his most prominent work was with uh, women with hysteria. He um, worked with uh, trying to understand what hysteria, and, and what we call post-traumatic stress disorder now, they called hysteria. So at this time it was called hysteria. By the time we get to World War I, we began to call it combat neurosis or shell shock. Um, and then it moves into, but it's the same set of symptoms, basically. And, um, and as he worked with women in particular who were diagnosed with, with hysteria, he developed his own theories about the workings of the unconscious and how, how the human mind works. Uh, he developed his theories, his famous theories about psychosexual development and the, you might remember like the id, the ego, the superego, all that kind of stuff. That's all Freud. So that was considered the first Viennese school of psychotherapy, and it was he developed psychoanalysis, which is um, <coughs> a way of treating uh, mental disorders. Um, that's uh, I won't really go into how that works, but anyway, that's kind of the basis of Freud. And for, for Freud, the chief motivation of humans is the will to pleasure. And so working out these psychosexual conflicts from very early on, he put that lens on and kind of saw everything through that lens. So the will to pleasure was big for Freud. Uh, Frankel was very influenced by Freud. He corresponded with him during his high school years. Uh, Freud actually published uh, Frankel's first paper in um, 1924. He actually was in his correspondence writing to him, and he um, sent him this manuscript just to see what he thought about it, and the next thing he knew it was published. <laughs> um, and uh, that was so he, Frankel was like 19 at the time, so this was an early start. He met him in person briefly in 1925. But before too long, in the mid to late 20s, he started parting ways with Freud, and he met up, he had some critiques. And so his, his uh, main critique of Freud was that he was too dogmatic, which I think I would probably agree with, especially if I'd ever met him. Um, but he was also too reductionistic for Frankel. He felt like um, to use this psychosexual idea and the will to pleasure as the chief um, understanding of the motivations of the whole human condition, he found was just too thin. That was like not big enough, not inclusive enough to explain the whole of the human condition. He disagreed that sexual impulses explained most things. And then he became interested in Alfred Adler and his um, individual psychology. Alfred Adler is the father of a movement called individual psychology. And um, so now we're going to talk about Adler for a minute. Adler's major contributions, he lived 1870 to 1937, so he and Freud were contemporaries, and he studied with Freud, and then they split. They parted ways um, early 1900s. He developed this second Viennese school of psychotherapy called individual um, psychology. And he focused more on environmental and social factors as things that impact um, the human condition. And he, he's the one that's responsible for naming the inferiority complex. So his ideas were all about like reason, social, mental health is reason, social interest, self-transcendence. Mental disorder is inferiority. So everything's driven by this inferiority complex, self-centered concern, superiority over others. So the chief motivation for Adler for the human being is the will to power, um, figuring out superiority and inferiority and doing this dance in the social order and outside of ourselves as individuals. So um, that was Adler's, that's, you know, really small dose, but that's kind of an intro to Adler. Um, Frankel's critique of 
Adler. Adler actually published Frankel's second paper just a year <laughs> after <laughs> he published, after Freud had published one. And um, he was very uh, close with Adler, apparently, for a good while. He um, st apparently stood up in a meeting. He was part of the, the Adler's society, and so they had meetings and stuff. And he stood up, apparently, in a meeting and, and disagreed with something. <laughs> and he said that Adler never looked at him again, never spoke to him again. He kept coming because he was okay with it. <laughs> but eventually, he learned that he was removed from the roles <laughs> of the um, Adlerian society. So anyway, he moved on from Adler as well, uh, from his inner circle in about 1927. But he actually really liked Adler's idea that neurosis is a form of compensation um, rather than these unconscious sexual issues that Freud looked at. But he did also critique him in that he felt like that was also reductionistic and that the will to power was also not enough of an explanation. And so this is um, Frankel's contribution then. He's coming on the heels of these two guys. And um, as he gets toward uh, this, and I didn't put this, I think it's in the later side, but. It's 1925 when um, Frankel finishes his medical degree in neurology. So he, by this time, he's studied at the University of Vienna and become a medical doctor. He's a neurologist. Um, I just have a quick question. Yeah. By reductionistic, it means yeah. it's just he's too narrow. It's not mm -hmm. an exactly. It reduces it down to kind of a, a reductionism means it reduces it down to a, a little like the parts are bigger than the, rather than the whole is the sum of the parts we're just looking at the parts and so you've just got one part you're looking at and for Frankel it was like no this is a much bigger whole and you're missing a lot by only focusing in on this one thing for both of those guys yeah uh, so for Frankel uh, his fragments of his early faith became reinstated around this time um, he introduced the German word Geist into the conversation, which means human spirit um, as an explanation of psychological phenomena. So this was a really big move in a way because um, Freud, of course, was certainly more of a materialist. He didn't really buy anything religious. So that was a big move. And he also frankly regarded the human spirit as the highest of our faculties, and in particular, the pursuit of meaning, that this was the um, big deal. So he developed what's considered the third school of psychotherapy, which is logotherapy. So if you think about Freud was up, uh, was on about the will to pleasure, Adler, the will to power, Frankel comes along and says, no, I think it's the will to meaning, that that explains way more of what motivates human beings, is our need to um, understand and, and know the meaning of our lives and to, to discover discover the meaning. Now, these days we say things like create the meaning. Frankel would have not liked that language, I don't think. He, he used the language discover the meaning. And, and I think that's a significant difference. <coughs> we'll get into that more a little bit later. Um, so Frankel's uh, timeline, his little bio here, from there uh, is when the war becomes a part of the picture. In 1925, he finishes his medical training. Um, and in between those, like in that 10 years, he opened a bunch of clinics for, um, he worked with people who were suicidal and depressed. And he actually offered a free clinic to high school youth. He did a lot of youth programs and, um, and worked at just really listening to the people that came. He opened a private practice by 1937. He, um, I think he practiced at one of the, the university schools in the hospital as well before that. But anyway, by 1938, the Nazis annex Austria. And in 1939, Frankel um, realized that he was, uh, that things were not going well. And so he actually obtained a visa to go to um, emigrate to the US. However, he felt a tremendous responsibility to his parents who were um, aging, and he really struggled with the decision about whether or not to go. And in the end, he, um, he was 
apparently praying for kind of a sign that would tell him whether he should stay or he should go. And he ran into someone that was doing a study on the Ten Commandments or something. And he said, so which one are you guys studying right now? And the guy says, honor your father and your mother. It's the one we're studying. <laughs> and for Frankel, that was like, there it is. And so he let his visa expire so that he could um, take care of his, his parents. He also had a sister who had emigrated to Australia. He had a brother who was still in Vienna. Um, so in uh, the first two years, in 1940 to 42, he's made the head of the Jewish hospital neurology department that um, the Nazis allowed him to head that department and that put off his deportation. So he took that job in order to delay being deported to the concentration camps. However, in 1942, he was ultimately arrested with his parents um, and his, his new wife. They'd been married maybe a year, I think, um, maybe even less, but I think a year or so, um, and his brother. They were all arrested. <coughs> um, and then during his imprisonment, he... The, all the correspondence with Freud that he had from his high school years was all lost. Um, the The story of his time in the camps is is quite, if you haven't read Man's Search for Meaning, I highly recommend it. Um, it's difficult to read because you're reading about a very uh, powerfully um, horrible experience in a concentration camp. And um, he's he at first published it anonymously. He didn't want to put his name on it because he didn't want it to be about him, but someone talked him into putting his name on it because they felt like that would give it more um, traction to have a further reading, basically, and more authority in a way, maybe, something like that, so he did. But anyway, he had also written a book that he was ready to publish called The Doctor and the Soul. That manuscript was lost as well. He moved around between camps. They, they transported prisoners in different places. Um, but he did spend some time in Auschwitz. Um, at the end, he was in two other camps that were, um, I guess they called them, I forget what they called them, but like side camps to Dachau. Um, and that's where he was ultimately freed um, later on. He tells the various stories of ways that his life was spared over and over again, times when somebody told him, no, be sure when you walk up to this guard, look over that way, and they'll send you left. And if you look that way, that's to the gas chambers. And so just little little things that um, made the, the difference between him being uh, killed and um, things like acting, even if he was sick to death, standing up straight enough that they didn't think he was weak and sick because if you were weak and sick, they went ahead and sent you away. So, um, and I think within the first few months, it wasn't very long before his father um, dies of starvation and pneumonia at um, the first camp where they were taken, which is, I don't even have to say that, Thier Um his mother died in the gas chamber at Auschwitz, and his brother perished at a mine at a branch camp. That's what they call it, a branch camp. Um, and then his wife, Tilly, dies at Bergen-Belsen um, right before the liberation. So um, just apparently weeks before the liberation, uh, she, was, uh, she died. So that was Frankel's story during his imprisonment. That was his first wife, Tilly puts a human picture on them. And so out of his experience in these concentration camps, he wrote the book, The Doctor and the Soul, he, which he had written before. Uh, and then when he got out, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he based that on his observations, um, the observations that he made of the human condition while he was um, in the various concentration camps. And so some of the, and, um, and then he develops, so in a way, logotherapy, which he had already developed, remember, that the primary um, pursuit of the human is the will to meaning, to finding meaning in life. Well, this was tested, obviously. <laughs> um, he was uh, tested, um, and his theories, he considered his theories 
validated by his experience. Um, and so he did a lot of observing of the humans th around him, and he made these observations into this book, Man's Search for Meaning. So for example, he says, and a lot of these next slides are his or direct quotes. I don't have quotes around all of them, but most of them are his words, just so, you know, no plagiarizing here. Um, he said that we watched and witnessed some of our comrades behave like swine while others behaved like saints. And that was really interesting to him because in these ho horrible conditions, there were basically two responses. There was the person who would um, grab the last piece of crust out of somebody's hand, even though they were closer to death than they were. Um, or there was the one who was close to death that would hand it to someone. <laughs> um, and, and this was really striking to Frankel that these two responses couldn't have been more different. And so his conclusion from that is that man has both potentialities within him. Which one is actualized depends on the decisions that are made, not on the conditions, because the conditions were the same for both of those choices, um, but the decisions were different. So that was one of his observations and conclusions. Um, he also observed that to be sure a human being is a finite thing and his freedom is restricted. Um, it is not a freedom from conditions, but <coughs> it is a freedom toward conditions. So he identified this as kind of the, the final, the main human freedom is not uh, with respect to um, determining our conditions, but rather with how we decide to take a stand toward the conditions. And that was what he considered sort of the ultimate human freedom. So everything can be taken from a man but this one thing, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Now obviously that's not a simple choice, it's not an easy choice, particularly when there's tremendous suffering involved. But it is a true choice, I think. Um, so. Another observation he made, some of the people in the camps would say that we must survive in order to make this meaningful. Um, he thought, wait, I think that's backwards because if this isn't meaningful, there's no point in surviving. <laughs> um, and so even the suffering has to be meaningful in some way or it doesn't matter whether or not we survive. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Do you want to? get the thing. Yeah. This may sound really stupid, but could we could we back up and explain how they're using the word meaning? Because I'm I'm my mind is going translation, purpose, explanation. I mean, uh -huh. what's meaning? Uh, well, we're going to get to that okay. a little bit, I think, but um but I think all those words work for it. Yeah. You said purpose. Translation, purpose, explanation. Explanation, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and I'll develop that a little bit more. Um, <coughs> so, right, uh, for Frankel, if there is meaning in life at all, there must be meaning in suffering. Um, so. Logotherapy was certainly tested during his years in the concentration camps. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about his theory, his logotherapy theory. Um, it's a meaning-centered psychotherapy, again that word that I'll, I will develop a little bit more, I promise, Logan, um, that the search for meaning is seen as the chief motivation of humans. It's often called existential psychotherapy, humanistic psychotherapy addresses, and by existential it just means that it addresses the questions of human existence. Um, <coughs> this is uh, his sort of summary maybe. It uh, deviates, or his, his critique of Freud and Adler basically, uh, that logotherapy deviates from psychoanalysis insofar as it considers <coughs> man a being whose main concern consists in fulfilling a meaning rather than in merely reconciling the conflicting claims of the id, the ego, the superego, which is Freud's view, or in the mere adaptation and adjustment to society environment, uh, which was Adler's um, take. So the principles of logotherapy, these are the assumptions, if you will, um, 
life has meaning in all circumstances. The desire to find meaning is the central motivational force. And humans have freedom to choose um, attitude toward any circumstance. We can discover meaning in three different ways, according to Frankel. <coughs> and he develops these a lot more, too. And I'll develop them a little bit, but not a ton, probably. Uh, by creating a work or doing a deed, by experiencing something or encountering someone, or by the attitude we take towards unavoidable suffering. So the first one, for example, by creating a work or doing a deed. For Frankel, one of the things that he says kept him alive in the camps was when he lost the, ma the first manuscript of The Doctor and the Soul, he was apparently hospitalized for typhus at one point. He was very sick with typhus. And um, yeah, sometimes I think I get some of these details wrong, so read it and correct me. But, um, but anyway, he, um, he wrote the notes for the second manuscript of that book on the back of prescription pads in the infirmary <laughs> in shorthand. So he like knew shorthand. Back then everybody did, I guess. My mother did. Anyway, he wrote notes for rewriting the book and he, he said that that project kept him going because he could think about, I gotta get this book published. I gotta get out of here so I can get this book published. And, it, and he said that there was, that was like a very fine line between kind of having that purpose that kept him going and the people who lost any sense of purpose or didn't have that, he said that they knew if somebody lost that, um, that they were uh, going to be dead very soon because you just couldn't survive without it. The second thing, by experiencing something or encountering someone, he's talking about um, working outside of yourself for another person or loving another person, and then the attitude we take towards unavoidable suffering, which he develops even more. So um, I already kind of said this, but this was the future-focused level of logotherapy that says uh, that we need to have something we're looking forward to. We need to have something that we um, can know we still have to do <laughs> in order to propel us toward um, discovering meaning. Um, so what we actually need is not a tensionless state, not sort of just peaceful existence, but rather a striving and a struggling <coughs> for, for a worthwhile goal, a freely chosen task. So we um, discover meaning by pursuing uh, meaningful work, for example. And then the other uh, was um, another principle of logotherapy is the idea of self-transcendence, that, um, that man is responsible and must actualize the potential meaning in his life. Um, the true, and this is an interesting piece, I think. The true meaning of life is to be discovered in the world rather than within man or his own psyche as though it were a closed system. And I think we have a lot of pop psychology out there these days that says, discover um, meaning, uh, find yourself. It's all in here like it's a closed system. But, it, but Frankel was very clear that this is not a closed system. We are in relationship with other people and um, the true meaning of life is to be discovered in the world, in how we transcend ourselves, in how we move out of ourselves. The more we, we forget ourselves by giving ourselves to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human we are and the more we are actualized. That was Frankel's conviction. Um, so the search for meaning, um, Frankel would say that one should not search for an abstract meaning. It isn't a, what is the meaning of life? It's not 41 or, um, was that the right number? <laughs> 42, I knew it, I always had that wrong. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not out there somewhere. He would say that everyone has a specific vocation or mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which, dis which um, demands fulfillment. And so that is up to each of us to discover what that thing is. <coughs>
And each situation in life represents a challenge and a problem to be solved. And so how we interact with the problems that we face and how we work to solve them is part of how we become more ourselves and more actualized. Um, and I like this, I had to read it a couple times the first time, but basically each man is questioned by life. So we ask life these questions, like what is the meaning of life? He's saying, no, it's actually life that's asking you the question. Um, you can only answer to life um, with your own life. And that's by being responsible for who you are, what you want, what you go for. And that that's where human um, actualization is. So some of his ideas and insights, um, I talked about the uh, focus on the future that kept him alive um, was the writing of the manuscript of his book. He also talked about the um, imagination. He found um, if he could concentrate on Tilly, he could remember her face and he could picture her face and he could be with her in that moment. And that that imagination also um, focusing on his love for her and her love for him was another thing that he could hang on to that kept him alive in the camps. So he would also say that meaning is individual and must be found, cannot be given. So like I said before, it's not something we create, but it's something that we discover. And I think that's a really significant difference in today's kind of zeitgeist. So being human is being responsible, existentially responsible, for responsible for one's own existence and how we decide to, to live it out. Uh, these are just a few, this is kind of a collection of sort of random quotes from him that I find um, helpful and interesting. So I'm not sure if they flow, but, um, but he, uh, this is something that I liked because he, this is where it landed for me in my first two years studying to be a counselor. Um, I was at the edge of a kind of a paradigm shift in the field where in the earlier years before I got into it, which has been like 20 some odd years ago now, um, it was shifting right then to where mental health was considered um, the connection to uh, reality as opposed to feeling good. By the time I got to school in the uh, late 90s, uh, the goal of mental health counseling is to help people feel good. Um, and I just think that's so thin <laughs> because, uh, and that's another thing that Frankel talks about. I don't think I have it on a slide actually, but he talks about how um, there's this thing where if you go toward something like, um, like being happy, I'm, my goal is to be happy. He says, you can't make being happy a goal because happiness has to ensue. It, uh, it's a side benefit of the thing that you're doing that is, that is purposeful or meaningful, that that will bring happiness most likely. But if you shoot directly for happiness, you're not gonna get it. <laughs> um, and he used that as a uh, technique at times, I think, with working with people with depression and anxiety to um, kind of as a paradoxical intervention sort of thing. So anyway, these were some of his thoughts that resonated for me in my work as a, as a therapist. Um, I work a lot with trauma and I'm often finding myself talking with people about how um, they, they feel like the way I'm responding to this is really um, out of uh, proportion, it's huge. And I find this really helpful to say, actually, an ab I mean, I don't say these words, they're his words. <laughs> an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. I mean, it makes sense that you would respond really big to something that's really tragic in your life, right? And he really got that. He also said that a man's concern, even his despair over the worthwhileness of life is an existential distress and by no means a mental disease. And I think that's where we're also very off these days, is that we're trying to help people feel better rather than really understanding what are the questions, what are the, what are the um, foundations of a life that provides some, found, some substance to that life. Um, 
And he also said that it may well be that interpreting the first, the existential distress in terms of the latter, a mental disease, uh, motivates the doctor to bury the patient's existential despair under a heap of tranquilizing drugs. Um, Frankel's view was that, that the therapist's task rather is to pilot the patient through his existential crises um, of growth and development. So this is a human project we're working on. He also makes the observation that I have said myself because I find in my own work, I, um, he made the observation that um, uh, these days, so this was even when, you know, back when he was working and living, that, um, that people tend to go to a therapist now rather than a rabbi or a priest or a, a, um, a pastor of some kind because that's where their existential uh, crises are um, going to be worked with, they hope. <laughs> but they don't, people, our culture doesn't any longer really trust um, the religious establishments to provide that. And I think that's a really interesting sociological thing, but um, I find that to be fairly true, culturally speaking, particularly for people, of course, who don't have any kind of religious affiliation. Makes sense. Okay, so back to why this matters to me. I already showed you this, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, my own project of integrating um, suffering and faith, Frankel was very helpful in giving some language to um, my experience of my mother in the nursing home, to my experience of understanding. Even as I saw her, she couldn't speak, but she could nod and she could shake her head and I remember very distinctly a conversation where I was kind of asking her this weird question that I think she kind of got, but it was um, basically, how are you with God with all this, right? Because this is bad. And, and I, I said, I'm really struggling with it. Um, and how are you with it? And she just went, like, <laughs> she made this huge face and expression that said, we're good. <laughs> and I knew that that's what she was communicating and it was really striking to me because I was like what <laughs> and I said are you saying I always repeated back to make sure I was understanding her and I said are you saying that you're good she just gave a big nod and said oh yeah and I thought you know what this is so mysterious there's no way I can understand her experience of this and and I have to say that um intervening years, so she's been gone over 20 years now, but um, especially the early, maybe the first five or 10 years after her death, I would have these dreams where, um, I don't think this is unusual, but um, she would be well from her stroke. She would be home and it was all done and she was like, all better. <laughs> and we were like, oh, Mom, we didn't think you were ever gonna get home. We didn't think that this was gonna happen this way. And she was like, yeah. And then I'm like sitting down to say, okay, I wanna hear everything about what that was like for you. And that's when I wake up. <laughs> Every time, that's when I woke up. But that has been a burning question for me, is like, what was that like? And apparently, her faith, um, her faith thrived in it. Uh, it certainly survived in it. So, um, <coughs> so that was, uh, so Frankel was helpful in uh, integrating suffering and faith for me. Uh, my, the second thing I mentioned is my need to understand how my choices interact with God's sovereignty. This was another part of my project, I would say, my personal project. And um, it has to do with um, the integrating of God's sovereignty and human freedom. Uh, like many of us, I don't know how many of us around here anymore are divine determinists, but I am one. <laughs> and uh, I believe that God is writing the story from a transcendent place and that, um, that he is utterly and completely the author of everything that happens, including my choices. So if I believe that, what the heck about human freedom? <laughs> what does that mean? And this has been um, a question for me and a project. And I think uh, it's an unfortunate uh, outcome for an understanding of divine determinism to result in kind of a fatalistic view of our choices here. I find that they are actually um, completely integratable 
if we understand God as author and us as characters in the story. And the reason I think that that's integratable is because um, if God is writing the story of my life as an author, he's outside the story, but I'm writing the story of my life from inside the story. And if you think about it that way, if you read a novel, the author is writing every word of dialogue, right? <laughs> but if you're inside the story as a character in that story, those characters are making choices and they take the story one way or another. And so I find uh, Frankel's ideas about human freedom as a response to our conditions, um, not from our conditions. God is the one that is sovereignly putting us into whatever circumstances we are. And I truly believe that even our suffering might be controversial. Even our suffering, I believe, um, is written by him. And, um, and the, the human level of my interaction with that is where I find um, faith or not. And so my decisions reflect um, the process I'm in toward faith. And again, it's the striving. It's not, the, it's not that I said something like this today to someone who was really struggling to understand some suffering in their life. And, and uh, we were talking about God's uh, participation, she was saying, the issue of God's sovereignty is a really big deal. And so we were talking about that. And, and we were talking about how there's really just two choices. One is to shake your fist at God and say, you don't have a right to do this in my life. Or we can say, not my will, but your will be done. And I clarified, it's not that we don't shake our fist sometimes, <laughs> but it's the striving and it's the ultimately coming toward, not even arriving necessarily, not even arriving to, okay, your will, my, you know, not my will, but your will be done. I might still be in tension with that, but I'm striving and I want that. And, that, and then that's gonna impact my decisions and that's gonna impact the direction that my life takes. So um, my choices reveal that posture of my heart and over time, I, I learn who God is writing, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so that was an important piece of this for me to integrate um, freedom, uh, Frankel's, particularly Frankel's idea of freedom and suffering within um, God's sovereignty. Um, and I wanted to read, I pulled out this book because I wanted to read um, a little paragraph that he wrote about this. Uh, he was talking about being in a group, uh, a group therapy session or something, and they were talking about this whole thing. So he asked a question to the group, and he said the question was whether an ape, which was being used to develop uh, polio serum, and for this reason was punctured again and again, would ever be able to grasp the meaning of its suffering. Unanimously, the group replied that of course it would not. With its limited intelligence, it could not enter into the world of man, that is, sort of an understanding of meaning and suffering and the things that we're talking about. The only world in which the meaning of its suffering, would, and that is the only world in which the meaning of its suffering would be understandable. Then I pushed forward with the following question. And what about man? Are you sure that the human world is a terminal point in the evolution of the cosmos? Is it not conceivable that there is still another dimension, a world beyond man's world, a world in which the question of an ultimate meaning of human suffering would also find an answer? I think that's profound, um, that we are limited in our view, and yet our faith calls us to trust that perhaps one day we will understand it. Um, even if we certainly don't understand it now. So um, say yes to life, even with all of this pain, guilt, death. Um, how do I say yes to my life in to my life in the midst of this human experience? And Frankel had something to say about this as well. He said that he called it his tragic optimism. <laughs> And tragic optimism for Frankel is an optimism in the face of tragedy and in view of the human potential, which at its best, at its best, 
not always there, but at its best, always allows for turning suffering into a human achievement and accomplishment, deriving from guilt the opportunity to change oneself for the better, deriving from life's transitoriness an incentive to take responsible action. So these are Frankel's um, responses to pain, guilt, death. These are kind of existentialist questions. So um, where a lot of the existentialist writers would say that we have to just deal with the fact that life is meaningless. And that's sort of where existential and existentialism has gone. Frankel would not agree with that. <laughs> um, so I've appreciated that. And I think that um, we could talk more about each of these things. I thought about putting in a whole section of what I think the biblical view of these things is. I think they're, uh, I don't think that these are inconsistent with the biblical view, but I would develop that a biblical view um, encompasses this and more um, about each of these, each of these things. So, uh, and then the last quote I'll end with is um, the last page of his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he said of his, that our generation is realistic, for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Israel on their lips. The Shema is the Jewish prayer that says, the Lord our God is one Lord. And it goes on. It's uh, the whole section, the beginning of the Talmud. Um, the end. Questions? Thoughts? <laughs> One of my favorite parts is when he was talking about um, coming out of coming out of Auschwitz and how they couldn't have fun, like they weren't able to. They were so used to just being numb that they didn't know how to have fun. Mm, yes. um, that was really fascinating, and just how he like was like how they had to like kind of play games and um, and think about their loved ones was really was really like I was like yeah I can see that I can definitely yeah. see how that would like help you out. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I had a I had a hard time understanding um, was when he mentioned um, the 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 how meaning has to be found in the out, towards the outside. Mm -hmm. So like, when does it? Because clearly there has to be like some kind of like interaction between the inside and the outside, where like the outside is like, all right, that that makes sense for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to like ask that question of like what is the, mm -hmm. where is the, the line between the two and how do those two connect mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if it's just the outside, mm -hmm. if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, I'm not sure he would say it's just the outside, but I think he's wanting to address the issue of it being this kind of closed system that we're going to find meaning inside of ourselves apart from moving outside of us. So yeah, I'm not sure he would say it's all outside because I think it's a, the, the person with choices who's engaging um, that project or that love or um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I also found he talks about in the book, this is what you're referring to at the, um, when he comes out of the camps that um, there were three stages that he noticed that people went through. The first was when they were first deported, just utter denial, just could not, um, you know, they're going to be out and, you know, we're, this is not happening. We're going to get out of this. And then once that is shattered, they go into an emotional numbness. And that the only, he said that it was just really stark and awful. Look at what people got used to seeing and not reacting to anymore because there was uh, no, there was nothing there because everyone was so close to death all the time. So, um, and then when they got out was the third stage was upon liberation. And that's the stage that you're talking about where it was very difficult to like wake up all that emotional numbness that, that had been so prevalent and so deep. Yeah. So the original question that he was disagreeing with, with Adler and mm -hmm. Freud, mm -hmm. 
was what's what's drives man mainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and he decided it was meaning. Freud thought it was sex, and Frankel thought it was a little more complex social situation. Adler. Yeah. Adler. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> is it possible that some people are driven by a search for meaning, and some people are just driven? by something more superficial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I don't think he would say that, n that those aren't drives, that the will to pleasure and the will to power are not human drives. He was just saying that they are not, um, they don't explain enough. And he, he felt like the will to meaning explains more. And so it isn't that those might be subsequent. I think that um, there is a, if I can find it, there was an interesting quote. I probably won't find it, but um, but he talks about the way that um, sex can become, uh, if it, especially if it is separated from a relationship and a love, that it can become a focus that is. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm not buying into the being driven by sex solely, but sure. I mean, as I interact and look at some people, they appear to be driven by something much less right. substantial than finding meaning. So yes. I guess yes. my I guess my question is is maybe he's trying to find an all encompassing answer for every person and I'm not so sure, at least yeah. superficially, that there aren't people that just aren't driven by something much more superficial than Mm -hmm. the need for meaning. Well, I think maybe how he would answer that, I don't want to speak for you, Mr. Frankel, but um, I think that uh, my guess is that he would answer that by saying, certainly, and they are not uh, becoming fully human in some way because, because human beings go in this direction. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, and it almost kind of strikes... They're not reaching for what God intended them to reach for is what you would say. Right, right, or their telos. Um, they're a target uh, place that humans are intended for. You know, it makes me think of, for example, in The Great Divorce when Lewis pictures um, heaven and hell and the differences in texture and substance between right. the two places where the people in hell are vapor and <laughs> there's like, there's nothing there. And when he is in heaven, the people are brilliant and solid and beautiful. I guess that what I'm... a metaphor. I guess what I'm saying is that would make a man like Adler not wrong. Yes. He's, he's looking at people and he's saying, this is what drives you. Yes. He's not saying yes. what should drive you. He's saying, this is what mm -hmm. drives people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. both can be right in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Chris has a question. Chris has a question. Well, I just... <laughs> I thought that's an interesting question, and I just want to sort of piggyback on that. And I wonder if the superficial person who is after power or after pleasure of some sort, um, to what extent in the heart of their heart, in their heart of hearts, are they haunted by the fact that they are not looking for meaning? That they that it seems like it would be a really take a lot of work to maintain the position that life really has no meaning, that you'd almost have to be sort of, you know, doing something to yourself to allow yourself to go there. I mean, even somebody who's willing to power usually feels like if they're getting enough power, then that will somehow make something that they did meaningful or at least everybody will look at them and say, ah, you were somebody, you did something. True. Yeah. You, you were significant in some way that your life had some meaning or something of that sort. It's harder with the, the pure pleasure, the hedonist or something like that. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not inside those people's heads, but I wonder. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> those of us who've read Jordan Peterson would think this would make a great conversation. The, these two guys could 
occupy oh my gosh. hours yeah. <clears throat> of discussion that would be beneficial to the yeah. audience. Um, somebody else said, what would it have been like? Somebody asked a question on an exam or something that Frankel heard about that, um, what would Frankel and Socrates have talked about if oh. they were in the same prison cell? It, well, <laughs> now, I've been reading <coughs> the uh, roots of, of Greek philosophy, and it seems that they are, mm -hmm. um, what am I? You know, what is a human being? Uh, why am I? Mm -hmm. As a human being, you know, what's my role in this reality, <coughs> and um, how? <coughs> how is a human being? What is the thing a human being is supposed to do? Yes. What is a right. human being supposed to choose? Mm -hmm. And um, so, when I was asking earlier the question about meaning, yes, I wondered if I actually got to that at all. Um, it seems that, you know, well, what is a human being is answered in Genesis. And, well, uh, what, what am I? Why am, why am I is answered in Genesis and Revelation. And we, we, we insert ourselves into the gospel narrative as, as an onlooker. or a, mm -hmm. um, And then um, how then should I live or what must I choose? Mm -hmm. uh, that's encapsulated in the law, in the history of people who are making these choices and succeeding or fa failing, and then our ultimate uh, location. And uh, <clears throat> it seems like the search for meaning is in our DNA. And a person who has reduced themselves to the search for power or pleasure or mm -hmm. safety or um, mm -hmm. numbness is a beast mm -hmm. and I think this is why Paul is allowed to refer to some people as beasts in one of his letters um, that's what mm -hmm. they have made themselves mm -hmm. and so he is so it strikes me that he he w was so at odds with his mentors um, that he was uh, a different thing a different mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had a different how to be a man. Yeah. And if what I'm understanding his, his meaning of meaning is, he is saying this is a reality. Mm. This is part of mm -hmm. the, the fabric of the universe. This is a part of my DNA. Mm -hmm. And these other guys have said, ignore that because that's your problem. That doesn't exist. Right. And... Mm -hmm. Not only is that going to mm -hmm. create conflicts between your ego and superego, between your id and your ego, mm -hmm. uh, so you have to give that up, and you have to adjust your machinery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which to me is just evil. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not one. I'm not one to say Freud was a brilliant. I, I kind of agree with Dietrich Bonhoeffer's dad. He despised Hitler. He said he was a fool and a liar. And he was a charlatan, that he just made stuff up and declared it to be scientific with no proof. And he said some horrible things about Freud. But um, I think there is a quality. So, uh, to eat. I need to interrupt you. I think you just had a Freudian slip. What? You said he said those things about Hitler. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, he, yeah. He, but you actually meant he's saying those things about Freud. Yeah, he said those things about Freud. Well, <laughs> okay. yeah, he said some Just thought I'd said clarify. some stuff about Hitler that got him in trouble too. Um, <laughs> um, but there is there is a certain quality of evil, like mm -hmm. basic, fundamental evil. Mm -hmm. To begin with, there is no meaning, mm -hmm. there is no purpose, and there is no. It's a lie, is what you're saying. That yeah, that, that is a lie, and I think and it's I a think choice. That's where Yes, right. Well, I think that's where, um, you know, partly it's, uh, I think, Frankel's ideas are that, um, again, I, I like how Chris said it, that, you know, this is the will to power, the will to pleasure could be where we're going to get meaning in some way, but meaning is fundamental to the human thing. Um, but then what you're alluding to, and I think where it went from here, you, you take it all the way up to nihilism, where yeah, yeah. meaninglessness is what's true. Right. And I just don't think there could be anything more of a lie from the pit of hell. And not only that, but it's really hard to live. Mm 
as a nihilist. I mean, there aren't very many consistent nihilists alive today. Um, because if you are really consistent with your nihilism, it, it's kind of the same thing that Frankel's pointing to in the camps. You really can't live very long right. as a really consistent nihilist. Um, and <coughs> so and I, think, I think he's really onto something. He's, and it's he's, a very he's true onto human thing that the Bible uh, would totally agree with. It's yeah. like you stop breathing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he says you yeah. have to be a human being, you have to want mm -hmm. to understand why you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you. Oh. It's the project. Yeah, it's the yeah. project. It's the project, being human. Yeah. I think you'll be in vengeance. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that kept some people alive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I was just curious about the factual tidbit that uh, F F Frankel and Freud met in secondary school, but their no. age. Right, no. Frankel went to the same school that Freud had gone to okay. earlier on. Because their they, big age difference yeah, confused right, me. Yeah, right, right. That's a good call, catch. Yeah, no, he met him in 1925. Um, so Freud would have been within 10 or 15 years of his death at that time. Yeah, no. So, Kenji, did you have? Oh, Gil, go ahead. Uh, Sorry. I, I had a question, like, um, yeah. what do you think the difference is between... Um, the people, because he talks about how when people got out, there is this, um, they became what they kind of beheld a little bit, like they became like mm -hmm. violent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then there are people that mm -hmm. um, maybe didn't become nicer, but like there was like just, just genuine, like genuine, like, cr like d creation of like, yeah, this is like people just switched. They just switched and became mm -hmm. what they beheld. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know mm -hmm. like, what do you think mm -hmm. made that happen? Mm -hmm. Um, is it like a sense of vengeance or is it like a loss of meaning? Like what, mm -hmm. and then how do you protect yeah. against that? Is it just the, the, the yeah. like the cultivation of meaning that like, protects you from that? Mm -hmm. So that's just my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think he would probably say it's an individual answer to it, you know, that there's probably not a blanket answer. But he definitely, he was under a lot of uh, critique for moving back to Vienna and actually resuming relationships with some people who had joined the Nazi party. He had one colleague at the hospital where he worked before the war who um, was a member of the Nazi party, but he did so many things to try to help Frankel and his family. Um, and Frankel understood what it meant to join the resistance. Um, it meant you were signing up to, if you get caught, you're dead. And, and so he really, he came out of it with a lot of uh, grace for people to have, um, and, and he got a lot of critique for that. He, he was really um, slammed for that quite a bit. Like, how could you move back to a city that betrayed you? And, you know, how could you even have a conversation with somebody who was in the Nazi party? But he was all about reconciliation, and he said, I don't think, he said reconciliation, how is reconciliation a bad thing? <laughs> You know, kind of let's move forward. But yeah, that that was definitely an that not everybody responded that way, <laughs> for sure. Kind of miraculous, actually, <laughs> that anybody would. But Gil, did you? Have yeah, so I see the overlap in Frankel's thought with like Paul talking about the grace that has been given me, right? Like my ministry is to do right his like vocation mm -hmm. and how how like his sufferings and his imprisonment and like his death are all like part of that. So I definitely mm -hmm. see the overlap between the sort of biblical view and, and Frankel's view. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, I think about how Kierkegaard talks about how um, one can be a self, but not under the one that established him, right? Like you could find meaning, but it could not be sort of in a relation to God. And that seems to be, could you talk about how, like, could you talk about the lack of overlap between sort of the Christian view and Frankel's view? Clearly there is overlap, but kind of. Mm -hmm. Where do they part? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't follow what you were saying that Kierkegaard, what, what part of Kierkegaard? Um, so Kierkegaard in, in The Sickness mm -hmm. Unto Death, he talks about how mm -hmm. I am who I could be and I am who I am now, 
and I'm mm -hmm. relating those two things. Mm -hmm. And I could figure out a way how to harmonize all of those things yeah. and still not relate to God. Yes. And yes. I would be in despair. Okay. okay, right. Gotcha. Yeah. So that seems, that that seems like it might not be... <laughs> That yeah. see, I mean, he says like mm -hmm. another human dimension. Mm -hmm. So, in yeah. you, you're well, right. Right. Well, so certainly where they m maybe don't overlap. I don't think that um, he he actually has a section in his recollections on faith, and he talks about how um, that isn't his thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, not faith, but theology. Right. He he. I think he had faith of some kind. Um, but he uh, distinguished that from psychology from theology. And he basically said, those guys need to talk about that part because <laughs> he wasn't going to get into it. But um, so I think there's probably places where, they, the, where the ideas don't overlap, uh, perhaps just because it's omitted, if you will, because I think Kierkegaard is right. You can relate yourself to yourself in the future, in the present and in the future. You don't necessarily by that relate yourself to God. And I think um, that's where um, maybe the question becomes, and he doesn't address this because he's doing, he, he also makes a distinction between the saving of a soul and the healing of a soul. And, and that is a distinction that he makes that I think is helpful because I think he would put the saving of the soul in the theology category and the healing of the soul um, in his category. And so it, partly it's out of omission that he doesn't go to there. And that's where um, in that section that I said I might have talked more about, you know, like, like the role of guilt, for example. I think that guilt is given to us by God as a way of um, bringing us in contact with our need for mercy. But mercy is available. And so, but that requires a relation this way, right? And so he's leaving that out in his work. Um, and so he's talking, I think, more about healing the soul rather than saving the soul. So I don't know if that answers it, but I don't think, I don't think really, I haven't found anything in him that I feel is inconsistent with the biblical view. I've only found where it doesn't go, it doesn't encompass enough of it, if that makes sense, yeah. All talked out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's good stuff, huh? Thank you guys for being here and for... Um